In a world where high-performance zero-defect buildings are hard to find, two men are on a mission to disrupt the status quo. Welcome to the Enifis Complex, the property design and development podcast. Let your hosts Adam Muggleton and Robert Bean keep you up with who is innovating and doing great work perspective on the adjacent possible and challenges to the status quo. Welcome to the Edifice Complex. I'm Robert Bean, your co-host and unofficial mediator here with my colleague, official agitator as always, friend and Yoda of most everything to do with buildings, Mr. Adam Muggleton. Say hello, Sir Yoda. Hello, Yoda. So, Adam, we get a lot of high achievers on the Edifice Complex, and today's guest is right up there with the best of them. Dr. William Bantliff is a professor and director of Indoor Environment Center, the Department of Architectural Engineering at Penn State University. He holds a doctorate in mechanical engineering from the University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign. And as a uh, registered professional engineer, he has over 30 years of experience as a consultant engineer and uh, as a researcher and educator. And Dr. Boffleff has been a member of ASHRAE since 1981 and is an ASHRAE fellow and distinguished lecturer. Bill, uh, prior to you joining Penn State, you were a uh, senior consultant at uh, ZBA or ZBA, depending on whether, what side of the border you're on. Provided analysis and master plan and design of uh, district heating and cooling systems. So we're going to definitely talk about that. And uh, before that, you were a principal investigator with the U.S. Army Construction Engineering Research Laboratory, working with building environment control systems and software tools for system design. Interestingly, you described your interests and goals as falling into the gap between practice, which frequently lacks rigor, true statement, <laughs> and science, which frequently ignores practical concerns, also a true statement. <laughs> And, of course, try to re identify those problems that are significant to district energy systems, indoor air quality, and uh, chemical and biohazards, I guess, security buildings. We should talk about that and do uh, research that addresses those. So welcome to the show, sir. Glad to be with you. So um, between your various uh, careers, you've uh, climbed your way up through the ranks of ASHRAE, becoming a fellow, earning the Exceptional Service Award. And most recently, I think you just earned the Lewis and uh, Louis and Bill uh, Holiday Distinguished Fellow Award. You're also a fellow of the International Society of Indoor Air Quality and Climate and have won the World Class Engineering Faculty Award. And you're also a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. That's a pretty impressive list. I have to think, though, one of your most proudest moments both for you and your family, and especially your dad was becoming the ASHRAE president uh, between that 2013-2014 years. So we love our high achiever guests, but we're particularly fond of how did they get their story. So tell us yours. Well, I was a high school student in the uh, mid-1970s, and like a lot of, quote, high achievers, first children fitting that paradigm, I tried to be as good as I could at everything, which meant that by the time I got to the point of deciding what I want to do with the rest of my life, I had no idea because I hadn't had anything <laughs> shake out that was clearly you know, the, a direction. But I was practical enough to, to realize that having a strong interest in music, but being capable of pursuing a career in science and engineering, that it would probably be a better idea to be an engineer and have music for a hobby than to be a musician and <laughs> try to have the kind of lifestyle I, I wanted to have. And I have to say, I was certainly inf influenced by my father, who had a, a career that in, in some ways is very similar to mine, although backwards. He started out as an academic and then went into uh, publishing his editor at HPAC for a long period of time and then wound up in consulting. And I've gone from government research to practice to academia. So I went to school and studied thermal science. And of course, again, I was very interested in getting a PhD right out of the box because I just wanted to pursue something to the, to the nth degree. And I was in thermal science. So I was, I think, hoping at one point to have a dimensionless parameter named after me at some point <laughs> in time. Um, but but I, I sort of uh, stalled out on, on theory. And when I started working at the Construction Engineering Research Lab, which is a, a core of engineers lab, I found it much more satisfying to do work that was related to something that influenced everybody's life in a way that I could, could see immediately, which was buildings. And so I, I redirected into that and did my PhD dissertation on uh, heat transfer and building foundations. And I always had the, the interest in being a, an academic, but I also came to realize while I was working at Searle that 
I wouldn't really feel comfortable trying to educate people for this industry if I didn't really know what it was about directly. So I did the strange thing of getting my PhD and then going into practice for five years full time working with, in my father's company, actually, in, in Cincinnati. And one day I got a call from Stan Muma at Penn State and they had a vacancy and was I interested. And he actually had to twist my arm pretty hard, but I, I interviewed for it and they made me the offer. And now it's almost been 25 years. So that's kind of how I got here. Wow. That's cool. So while we're at this point, because uh, we have a lot of questions for that, how is Stan? I see him now and again. I think he's still a little bit professionally active, but believe it or not, he's been retired from Penn State for, I think, uh, close to 10 years, maybe more than 10 years. Is that right? Yeah. But he kept very busy preaching the the gospel of Doaz, if you will, which is yeah. uh, something that really fascinated him and occupied his time for probably the last 15 years of his career. Well, if you think about, you know, dedicated outdoor air systems and, you know, where they are today, a big part of that was Stan. He's, he's yeah. touched the industry in a big way. I think he brought uh, a rigorous approach to it and really looked at it from every angle. He sometimes wondered how, how someone could be so focused on one thing for so long, but I think we've benefited a, a lot from that and this concept of dual pass systems and separating latent load from sensible and ventilation has really caught on. It's, it's the right idea. Anyone who looks at it has got to conclude that that's a, a better way than the all-air system. See, we ought to do this show in visual because Adam started to glow when Bill said that. He's not, Adam's, not, Adam's not pregnant. He's just really happy to hear that, that Bill talks about separating latent loads and sensible loads. Because that's something that when I got out of school in 1983, all we did was our sensible systems were radiant-based and our ventilation systems were air-to-air heat exchangers. We did that, you know, that was in 1983, but it was all low scale. But, you know, I mean, what Stan has done is, of course, ramped it up, and that makes Adam happy. Hey, you yeah. I'm a big fan of dedicated outside air, and, you know, I'm a big fan of hydronic systems as well. And just get rid of them big ducts and yes. into hydronic. You know, when I was a property developer in the UK, a big part, I should be a development manager, and a big discussion when we were doing developments was, how can we shrink the slab to slab space? How can we shrink the risers? You know, how can we reduce the elevators? Because you know, the, the net to gross ratio, the way rent is calculated in the UK is different to America. So every inch on that net to gross in an office matters. I've seen surveyors and measurers argue over an inch because over 25 years amortized, that is a lot of money. When rents are 80 pounds, what's that, $140 a square foot for an office in central London? So, you know, radiant heating and cooling systems dominate over there because of that, because you can get small riser spaces, lower slab-to-slab heights, whereas in the, in the U.S., buildings are leased on a more of a gross space basis. So big ducts, there's no penalty for a big duct if you're a developer. You can put in an on-floor AHU, massive duct work, and, you know, the tenant just pays. It's crazy. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's the, the, the who, who builds and who pays to operate it uh, yeah. issue comes up all the time. And we always oversimplify that on life cycle cost. But when it's split between two parties, it uh, doesn't work, does it? No, but then no. there's the energy efficiency aspect, right? You know, moving massive amounts of cool, cool through, through ductwork is not as efficient as moving it through a one or two inch pipe. Sure, it makes very little sense, and it creates all sorts of control problems. And I like the compatibility with with district energy yeah. as well of, yeah. of having hydronic based. Yeah, Bill, we're gonna come. We're gonna spend some time on that. We always love it when the academics come from a basis of practical experience, and we always love it when engineering students have spent a few years on a job site before they before they graduate or even enter university. And I remember in our practice when we hired guys, that was one of the criteria we looked at. You know how to swing a hammer? Have you been out on the job site and used the surveyor level? Like, do you know what concrete actually is, you know? And we knew the guys that came first through the trades, then went to university, were much better engineers. and. You know, do you find that in your colleagues in the academic world that the that the academics that have a practical experience bring a different edge to the to the program? Well, I would say that they probably teach differently, and they they recognize some of the uh, the skills and and uh, perspectives that are going to be valuable in practice. That uh, if someone is a uh, an academic who's went from their PhD to a couple of postdocs, and now they're teaching HVAC fundamentals, they have no idea about these things. You can't fault them for it, but they just don't 
know where these landmines are, the, the issues are going to come up in, in practice. So I do think there's value to that. Yeah, I see research projects all the time, for example, that look at, at ventilation and they're structured in a way that's convenient for analytical purposes, but they, they don't reflect the nature of the standards and codes that everyone's going to have to build to. And you always ask in those PhD exams, well, you know, what, what if, if you're putting this control strategy into a building that's got to comply with standard 62.1, which, you know, is, kind of violates all of your assumptions? Yeah, that, that's a sort Oops. of just, a, 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 just one example of many. Yeah. I also think that when they come from a practical world, that they have a better understanding of three dimensions, the third dimension. They, the, their ability to visualize spaces uh, seems to be more tuned than those that haven't had the practical experience. Sure. Coordination, you know, when you see the whole building coming together, you you can't just put on blinders and look at your little piece of it. I, I think that's very valuable. And I, you, know, it, you don't get students who've gone through the trades very much here, but at least we try to get them to get practical experiences in their summer jobs. You know, it, yeah. Penn State Architectural yeah. Engineering is, I think, the only five-year program left in the, in the U.S., and it, it's quite different from, from the mechanical engineering route. The, they get a broader education in all of the, the building systems, and they also typically have, uh, students have an opportunity to get two or three summers in where they work in design offices or, or my preference, I tell them, if you can get a job with a contractor and get sent out into the field, you know, take it because that's priceless experience and kind of yeah. fits in what you were saying. I agree with that. You know, there's nothing more gotta, humbling than having a 300-pound pipe fitter tell you that your drawing sucks. <laughs> yeah. I, learned, I learned a lot of what I learned in those five years as a consulting engineer because of the fact that our firm focused almost exclusively on on existing systems and retrofits. And so you always got sent out into the field. And, and those were the days when there wasn't the separation that we have now between design and, and commissioning. So we did you know, construction services and you had to go make sure that your system was working and the operators were trained. And and so that, that was, I think, a much richer education than you might get from being in a design office today where you just keep turning out the same thing and don't necessarily see or have to live with the consequences of what doesn't work right. Yeah. I was going to share, a, I, I will share this story, even though you're a past ASHRAE president, I'll leave the names out. <laughs> <laughs> you, you'll know who the, you'll definitely probably, you know the person, a very colorful individual within the, within the world of ASHRAE membership. We were at a committee meeting and uh, one of the uh, universities were presenting some of the research. We had funded a research project and he was up there with his student and you know, the room was dark and the screen was they were projecting all of these formulas way over my head kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, all these uh, meek uh, professors were around the table. And one of the guys that was on the committee, you know, came storming in, dressed not like the other professors, <laughs> looked at the screen and no kidding, Bill, within probably 10 seconds, you know, he's going, that's effing wrong, that's effing wrong, that's effing wrong. I got to go. See you later. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> and then then the room went quiet right a because everybody was shocked at the colorful language and then half the people didn't know who the guy was that came into the room but then the, then the professor starts looking at the screen and he goes you know what he's right <laughs> this is all wrong <laughs> and that's the world of ashray but that individual came up through the trades, ultimately earned his PhD, and he just has it, you know, he can swear like the best welders, right? <laughs> but, but he's got that academic mind, and it's sharp, and, you know, he came in and literally just uh, shut the room down, and rightly so. It was an interesting experience, to say the least. <laughs> well, this, but Adam, in the UK, it's a standard practice, though, for parts of the education systems for guys to come up through some yeah, trade so experience. In the UK, there's two routes to being a chartered engineer, which is a professional engineer equivalent. You can either go full-time at university, straight out of school, or you go to an employer, a contractor, or a design office, and they send you on what's called day release. So you get a mixture of, you know, in-the-office work, and you go to college one or two days a week, and it goes into evenings. I did that route, so I used to work and then go to college one day a week and in the evenings. So what you have the benefit of there is, you know, you're doing this theory, and then you get in the office, and you think, 
you can do the practical and you have access to people who are doing it every day. So you come out with a lot of clarity on application because there's a the disconnect I think is between sort of it's the difference between pure math and applied math, right? There's pure engineering and sort of theory engineering and then there's applied engineering. And I so, say, you know, when you've had a big pipe fit or a duck fit I tell you that you suck several times <laughs> to your face. <laughs> it sort it sort of stops you making that mistake more than two or three times, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they 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 like to humble you before you. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you you probably remember Tim Wentz's story about uh, having them him to climb up on top of an air handling unit, and while he was up there, they took the ladder away on his first yeah. day on the job <laughs> with his father's contracting firm. Yeah, well, we we had uh, our trip That's was humbling. you get a new apprentice or a new trainee, you give him a marker pen, and you put him inside a big duct and tell him to put arrows on so the air knows which way to go. <laughs> and depending if they climb in or not, it's depending whether they're a keeper or not. <laughs> yeah, that's just a little bit like like co-op in in the U.S., although that's done in segments. Yeah, you, know, you have a semester on and a semester off. Yeah, but I look forward now, and I I've been a partner in an M and E design firm, and there was a very big gap between the partners that came up through the day release and the others who went through the block, sort of like straight into academics. And the difference was in the errors and omissions on the drawings, quite frankly, right? Some of them, a lot, this is super aggregate and sort of like average. But on average, you know, the guys who came up with the day release tended to produce better work that you could just put out there and build, you know? And uh, yeah. it doesn't make it good or bad. It's just the way it is. Well, you know, I think that's great. There, there is a, you know, a potential unintended consequence, which is you get students out into practice and you start having the people they work for saying, well, that's not how we do it. And they come back and they think that the, the theoretical underpinnings you're trying to build for them, which are going to save their old bacon yeah. later in their career when they, they get a situation that they haven't seen a hundred times before, they want to write that off. And so, you know, we have this tension, I think, between getting them to absorb fundamentals, knowing that that's going to be something that's kind of in the background and aids their physical understanding rather than being the way you do it in a production environment. Yeah, yeah. I agree and if with that. Yeah. Practices in, out to industry, I think we want our students to be carrying new ideas out and then being the ones that instill those in the culture rather than having, having them already be bounded by it before they ever graduate. Yeah, I, I agree with that, ultimate, uh, absolutely, because there's the, knowing the fundamentals is like uh, being an apprentice, uh, I know, blacksmith, you know, you've got to swing that hammer a thousand million times, right, to know how to do it. So having them fundamentals in place is, is absolutely key. What I think is, certainly in North America, uh, it shook me, there's, there's this big sort of like caste system between the white collar office work of design engineering, I'm talking about applied building services design engineering, and then the, the field work. There's even... In my old firm, there was, uh, you know, there were people who designed buildings and building services, and then there was a separate team that did the field work, and there was this sort of like disconnect and lack of ownership of the design because they put the design out under pressure with not enough fee and not enough time, the usual story, right? And then yeah. it was on the field guy to like pick up the errors and omissions and like manage the, they were like a PR guy, right? They were managing the fallout and minimizing the costs from that and giving some of the fixes on the fly. So there was this disconnect between field, like blue collar, white collar, field office. I think that needs to be yeah. narrowed. I think professional versus trade, there's there's a inappropriately large gap in status in the yeah. U.S. I, I spent a sabbatical in Denmark, which is a place you like to talk about. And I, I think it is, there's a lot that's great about it. And that's one thing I I like there was the the flatter society and the trades people were paid better and respected mm. more and and I, I thought uh, yeah maybe lived up to to those expectations too and I, I wish we would see more of that here. I see less of the distinction in say our physical plant operation at at, uh, at my university and others. I think you know there where you've got engineers who are really in facility management and design, working with the staff that maintains the buildings, I think they tend to be closer together than between the, the designers and the, the people who feel. Yeah. I think one of the things that engineers quickly learn is how important the trades are in making their designs turn out the way they intended. And I think, you know, I mean, Adam, well, we've all been on projects where we've faced challenges and thank goodness for the smart technician, you know, that could 
yeah. fix whatever it is that we we're not we're not angels are perfect by any stretch of the imagination. We're applying the principles. Yeah. Sometimes we screw up, and these guys and girls, you know, sometimes come out the heroes, make us look good. I'm still in awe of the guy who's on site and he can do a quick 3D sketch <laughs> on the back of a pad and yes. you know, coordinate it all and just send it to someone <laughs> and it works. I love that. I, I yeah. do not have that skill at all, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah. So, so you mentioned Denmark. You have a strong background in district energy. And of course, Denmark is a country that has embraced district energy, just like Germany has and Sweden and other Nordic countries. So what's the problem here on the continent? We just can't seem to get communities understanding the benefits of district energy. Well, you might be able to convince them of the benefits, but when they see the price tag, I think initially, and realize what kind of a commitment there is to to implementing it, I think that becomes the problem. And you take Denmark, the population there is something like five and a half million compared to hundreds of, of millions in the U.S. in a much smaller area. But they, they've been working at it for, for 30 years, building out a concept and and over time it's gotten to be uh, really impressive what they're doing if you're going to do that in the US you have to go back and and get political commitments social commitments to implement it because you're really changing the whole community there's a huge payout at the end but you you have to commit to a long process of putting in the infrastructure it's like building the the, you know, the, the thermal interstate system Really, you know, where would we be without the interstate highways in the in the right. U.S. today? I don't know if you could do that project today either. I think you're right because it ultimately comes down to political leadership and long-term thinking, which are yeah. two things that are really tough to do, particularly in today's environment. And, and yet, we need to get there. There's going to be a very interesting debate at the uh, annual ASHRAE meeting. The topic is one that we've debated before, which is: Are cities sustainable, or can they be sustainable? I think that that would be uh, an interesting one for for a lot of folks who might be attending to to sit in on. Yeah, that's interesting because if you take say a city like New York, which I go to regularly, you know there is possibly existing infrastructure there that could help a district system. Right, there's tunnels, there's networks under the ground. So Old run, steam system, yeah. yeah running there long pipe, running. St- so some of the infrastructure is is a give is a free is given for free if you like, but there still needs to be the political leadership and the long term thinking, right? Because we're basically short-term animals, ultimately. Yeah, there's heating infrastructure in a lot of systems. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's it's old steam systems for the most yeah. part. Putting in cooling in parallel with that is what would really benefit. You know, something that comes up all the time is, oh, if we could only get battery storage for $100 a, a kilowatt hour. I went to a presentation when I was in Denmark at an IEA annex meeting about sustainable communities. And they showed us an example of, of how they're doing it in Denmark, and they're doing seasonal hot and cold storage, basically to store their excess wind power production. They go to electric boilers or to chillers yeah. to, to put their capacity in. And oh, they yeah. claim that the, that the cost of that is a euro a kilowatt hour Wow! in those systems. So they're two orders of magnitude below the the threshold. So, I mean, that's the sort of gain we could realize if we would do that, because everybody's talking about the duct curve and, and yep. batteries. We've, we've known how to do thermal storage for over a century, <laughs> and it's sitting right there, and it, it, to a large extent, does the same thing if you have integrated utilities. So, you know, if we can't even do that, I don't know how we're going to do some of the other things that we want to do. I mean, that is the, that's the interesting, key, right? Storage and yeah. electrical storage, thermal storage, that is the key to a lot of these technologies, right? Certainly in the power management. Yeah space yeah balancing out systems you know and, and the other thing i want to say i listened to one of your other podcasts where your your guest was knocking the, the net zero building concept and i'm i'm right in in line with that uh, maybe not for all the same reasons but but because the single building scale is all wrong for for maximizing the economics of it when you look at what happens when you aggregate thousands of loads together you get flatter load profiles that are easy to deal with. You have a smaller peak load, you have a smaller requirement for redundant capacity. And so you can do the same thing in a more coordinated, effective way for less money. And you can realize efficiencies, right? Because when you've got predictable yes. demand, you get you can get efficiencies on direct plant sizing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of payoff to it. It's, is it, do you think that, 
you know, certainly in North America, I count myself as North American now because I'm Canadian, but there's such an abundance of resources and cheap energy in North America. Do you think that's a barrier? It's a, sure, it's a, a barrier to um, driving towards more, more efficiency if, if you don't buy environmental arguments. You know, I would right. think that uh, even if energy is cheap, if you believe that we're doing to the environment what most of us, I think, believe we are with fossil fuels, then there would be a strong driver to get, get out of it. Yeah, so so it's, it's, it's a disincentive. It's this a disincentive. Is the externalities so, so here's, the here's another question for you to ponder. What happens if, if everybody eventually has clean, renewable energy available to them? Is that going to eventually drive our view of cost effectiveness in the other direction? I, I was thinking a, a while ago about how expensive ground-coupled heat pumps are, and they, they make great, great sense now where we're using electricity that comes from fossil fuel sources and it's expensive. What happens if we get so successful with wind and and PV that it's cheap again? Then would anyone ever put in a ground coupled heat pump if they could could have a a, an air source heat pump that was was getting clean energy? I I don't know. But I I think that the trend we're on will not continue forever just like many others. I agree. There's a lot of unintended consequences in terms of externalities, but also just, for example, I was talking to someone the other day here. So there's a scandal in the low, in the provincial election up here about the cost of energy. And everyone's going, well, one day, you know, we're all going to have so we'll have solar and wind power. But, you know, just take the big energy company here where I live around Toronto. You know, they have pension obligations up the wazoo. So if you think energy becomes free and you're not going to be paying for them pensions, <laughs> you've got another thing coming. I've got a lot. I've got a guaranteed winning lottery ticket. I want to sell you if you believe that. You know, so you're paying for this one way or the other. The question is, do you? How cheap can it go while still maintaining pension and obligations that have been accrued over time? The real benefit accrues to the environment ultimately, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. How, how you. You know, monetize that and distribute the benefit to everyone yeah, that's or the bear question. the cost. It's, yeah. Yeah. it takes a skilled politician with some uh, environmental engineering knowledge, I guess, right, to handle that. And I don't see many of them on the horizon. I was going to say, that's an oxymoron, <laughs> skilled politician. <laughs> I was going to say, I think our last engineer president was, was Jimmy Carter, and that didn't end well. No, he, got, uh, he got pilloried, didn't he? He got abused yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Wasn't it Reagan's? He did a lot of good things, but he uh, didn't make people happy. Yeah. I think Reagan's first act in office was to rip the solar panels off the White House roof, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. God. Paint over them until they can remove them. Uh... <laughs> 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 so I think we're, we're aligned. I mean, district. I'm a big fan of district energy, but I am a sort of bearish on people's ability to embrace the long term. But what about other other trends? Like I love this trend back towards dedicated outdoor air systems um, to dealing with latent and sensible loads separately. Do you think? Do you see that as a trend? Like, so you, you're you're in charge of educating young engineers and releasing them to the world. It's like a catch and release program, right? And are they going out there with these ideas firmly embedded now? Do you think? Oh, yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, I, I have a, a class that I teach in the fourth year before they, they do their senior design project, and we try to roll through the, the whole Rolodex of different system options that they have available to them and give them some sense of, of what the strong and, and, and weak points of them are. And it, it's hard to to talk about VAV systems and, and, and come up with much, but the you know, problems that other systems <laughs> solve at this point in time. So... Yeah, I think they're they're attuned to the idea that there are better ways to, to do it and that some of the, the cheap systems are, that's the only thing they have going for them. Yeah. I mean, and actually, I, I'm, I'm talking to people lately uh, who, who say they're doing, they're, they're doing uh, radiant cooling, passive chilled beam DOAS systems cheaper than VAV. And if you've talked to Tim McGinn there in Calgary yeah. about the, the library project, but he said yeah. they can, they know how to do that cheaper now. Than, than a conventional alternative. Yeah. That's a Tim, really what, breakthrough, that is, actually. Yeah. Yeah, Tim, we, I was the, uh, the chair of the uh, Stan 55 uh, user manual, and Tim was on my committee. And, uh, you know, he, he, again, a, pract- a practitioner, but he, he had both an electrical degree and mechanical. He's dual dual practitioner. And he's just a, brings a huge amount of skill to any design project. Adam, we're going to have to get him on. Yeah. Uh, that's a good name to bring up, Bill, because he, he's a skilled uh, skilled engineer. Yeah, I'd listen. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and he's a great. I mean, is a obviously he's a huge contributor to Ashray, and and you know, that, yeah, he's he's really solid in the in the organization and brings a lot of leadership to certainly to the local chapter and also to the national. He does a lot of work at national too. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting hearing your take on VAV because for me, a VAV system is the equivalent of Concorde still flying. You know, it's like 1970s technology that just will not die. <laughs> you can drive yeah. a stake through its heart and it gets straight back up. Right? <laughs> it's just. <laughs> I think that's a supply chain logistics sort of cognitive entrenchment issue. This is why, again, I'm keen that. It's good to hear that students are coming out with other ideas other than just studying the VAV playbook. Mm -hmm. VAV has its place, but it does. Does it have to be in every building? I don't think so. <laughs> no, no for, it, at least consider a, a, an alternative. Yeah. I mean, this is you know the approach that you try to teach is when you do your system selection, you, you've got to be able to come up with with three or four significantly distinct alternatives with different strengths and weaknesses, and let them fight it out under your your set of, of conditions right yeah. which which brings it in, an inter, back to the interesting point of the program architectural engineering which you don't see that often <laughs> i think you said penn state is probably one of the few universities that have a program i think in i think university of waterloo john straub mentioned it at a conference here that they're going to introduce a new architectural engineering program so the students that are graduating out of their bill what percentage of their exposure is to architecture versus the engineering side? I think in, in ours, our curriculum, they have close to the equivalent of a semester of architecture by the time they're they're done. So they, they take theory class and uh, architecture history class and some studio. And, and the, the point is not to make architects out of them, but to have them understand architectural thought. And so that would hopefully make them a better team member in, in uh, a design team. And now that integrated design is really all the rage, yeah. uh, they should fit right into that, but they always have. Of course, that's our approach is that we spend three years on core curriculum and getting the students at least exposed to all of the, the different aspects of the building structure and, and lighting and electrical and acoustics and mechanical. And they pick one of those and specialize for, for two years before they graduate. So it's a little bit like building services, but with the rest of the construction process added on. We have a construction management option in our, uh, our program also. I like that. That's a really, that sounds like a great degree for a rural. But they're only about 20, I think there may be 20 accredited programs. I don't know if that's worldwide or in the U.S. It's increased from about 15 when I started, but it's slow. And I tried to estimate how much of the demand for entry-level engineers we might be meeting, and I, I can't believe it's any more than 10%. So you know, 90% of the mechanical designers out there had uh, thermal fluids heat transfer, and I would bet half of them didn't even have the HVAC course in their mechanical engineering curriculum, and they learn everything that they're, they learn on the job. Yeah, that's yeah. one of my criticisms of the North America system. Your, yeah. your course seems to be what I would call a building services course. Yeah, a lot of people I interviewed for my business when I was in Canada was, you know, they'd be mechanical engineering students or graduates, but what they were were people who were good at math with thermodynamics chucked in. There was no yeah. applied engineering in there at all. They literally started from scratch when they were hired, which yeah. was tragic. Well, why I asked that question was because when you mentioned about being able to develop, you know, four or five strategies, HVAC strategies, I mean, as buildings have evolved or changed in our way that we understand buildings and new materials, you know, a graduate that comes out of a mechanical engineering program with very little HVAC exposure gets exposed to a, you know, a design and depending on the practice that they're in, there's going to be a limited number of solutions. But the person that comes out from an architectural engineering program gets that the systems that we dis we choose is intimately tied to the architecture. Yes, they're not they're not separated at all. They're one of the same. And in fact, guys like Jeff McDonald and I don't know if you know Jeff Bill, but Adam knows Jeff quite well, and I know Jeff quite well. And in one of his statements, and I think he actually took that from the guys from Transolar, and that is that. HVAC begins with the enclosure. We don't even start talking about fans and pumps and chillers and boilers until we look at the enclosure. And I think the architectural part of that program was quite valuable to your students. Yeah, I, I think we've been through an interesting cycle in, in the history of architecture. Before we had air conditioning, architects were responsible 
for designing forms that were both aesthetically pleasing and that also would be habitable. Sometimes they succeeded better than others, but high ceilings, tall windows, not too deep so you could get natural ventilation flow. And at some point, they realized that the mechanical engineers, electrical engineers could allow them to do anything with form. And we wound up getting buildings that had to be conditioned all the time to work. And I, I think, I hope that current events are driving us back in the other direction where we, we start with architectural design that, that minimizes the need for mechanical electrical systems. And then we do our, our best with, with that, as well as having aspects of integration that are possible now, like dynamic envelopes and those sorts of things. Yeah. We did a literature review for a paper. Well, you were there. It was the, the IAQ conference in Vancouver a few years ago. And one of our statements was that all temperatures related to conditioning people in buildings do not need to be any more than 77 and a half degrees plus or minus 22.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. In other words, all the temperatures that we need inside of a building can actually be lower than core body temperature. Yeah. And so when you think about the gener and this goes back to district energy and then the word exergy and, and we had Bjarni on that the other day and we talked a little bit about exergy. We're going to introduce that concept to our audience, by the way, <laughs> a teaspoon at a time. How, how, many, how many programs will that take? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you think about it, right? So if we can condition buildings with temperatures less than what's core body temperature, why in the heck are we generating 3,400 degrees Fahrenheit or 1,700 degrees C? you know, during the combustion process. Like that just, that spread between what we generate and what we need is, uh, it's offensive. Yes. Right? So, I, yeah, go ahead, Adam. It's a case of doing what we've always done and getting what we've always got, right? Uh, yeah, so sometimes you need these heretics, the Steve Jobs of the world. We, our, This industry needs an Elon Musk or Steve Jobs. It needs someone to come up and be inspiring and just completely get the table and tip it up. Yeah. <laughs> and knock everything off it, well, right? Well, I read in the paper this morning that Elon Musk is selling flamethrowers in California, which hasn't gotten him any fans there. But uh, <laughs> aside from that, he's a great guy. <laughs> the Edifice Complex will continue in just a moment. If you're enjoying this podcast, we need your help. We're not asking for money, just a minute of your time. Our goal is to make the Edifice Complex podcast as relevant, educational, and useful as possible. By having good ratings, we can reach the widest audience. Therefore, our request is two small things. If you haven't already, leave us a review and rating on iTunes. And subscribe to the Edifice Complex on YouTube, even if you normally only listen to the audio version. These two things will help us immensely. Also, if you would like Robert or Adam to speak, teach, or consult on your project or business, please email admin at edificecomplexpodcast.com. Thanks for your time, and now, back to the show. My, my daughter's recently graduated as an engineering student, and what's interesting <clears throat> there is how unenthusiastic all of her cohort are about building services and buildings. They would rather mm -hmm. flip burgers, some of them, than go into this industry. And they are, all of them, want to work for Elon Musk. So my takeaway from yeah. that is, you know, Elon Musk, is he puts his trousers on one leg at a time, I'm pretty sure, right? But what he is, yeah. is a symbol for change, a symbol for possibility, right? We need that in our business. We've got to find that yeah. guy or girl. Well, and you need an education, too. I mean, you yeah. can't sell all sizzle but you do have to to create some enthusiasm and and inspire otherwise people are not going to want to do the hard work to learn their their thermo and, yeah. and uh, the other things they they have to do so you know i think it's great that these days we have these issues like the environment and wellness to motivate them because i, I think we're we're getting students out now uh, whatever else you want to say about them they're they're kind of uh, idealistic and, and, and see what they're doing is really being important to society, not just a, a job. Yeah, that's it, the why, right? Why is what they do important? It's important because everything they do compounds over time, right? They do a shitty building, that shitty building's there, consuming there energy for 20, 30 years, right? Yeah. 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 I can't think of another profession, you know, that has such a long-term impact that can be both positive and negative, and it's one of the few professions where you 
get to integrate all of the sciences, mm. physics and the chemistry. And, but then there's also the communication part of it. Bill, you brought up the wellness side of it. That, I think, is an, an incredibly important element that's getting integrated into, the, into our vocabulary, as is engineering being integrated into the physician's vocabulary. We're starting to see that as well. So, But that's not new. I mean, we, there's been several conferences over the last 25 years where architects and or the engineering community gets together with the health professionals. But what seems to happen after those conferences is after everybody's been and gone, everything dies again. And I think there needs yeah. to be more permanent organization uh, brought together on these topics. Yeah, I, I agree. I, mean, I understand ASHRAE is, is talking about a task group to work on wellness that'll bring in a lot of organizations. And we've started this Indoor Environmental Equality Global Alliance that has right. somewhat the same aims. I think in education, we need change too. I, I, I think a, a, an HVAC designer is trained, educated mainly as a physical scientist. You know, they, yes. they, they learn how to design a, a well-functioning machine according to some model. They don't know much about the people inside of it or what happens to them. And I, I think a little more biology and psychology in the curriculum would really help to overcome that issue. You know, an interesting thing that, again, this comes from a comment in one of your other broadcasts is that about residential is that people go home to, to houses every night, you know, do, do engineers not have the ability to do good things in, in residential? But I, I, what I thought of when I, I heard that was the, the, the old is cartoon or there, there's a, a fish in the water and someone says, how's the water? And the fish says, what water? <laughs> and we spend so much of our time in built environments that we, we forget that they're there and forget that they need to yeah. be designed and maintained and operated well. Yeah, yeah. that is a That's very a great... astute observation, actually. I think it's a leadership issue, but what happens is, the question is, where does the leadership come? Does it come from academic? Does it come from conferences or organizations like ASHRAE? Or does it come from... Star architects and star engineer. I don't know, but there seems to be, it's clearly a leadership issue to me, but I'm not clear where the leadership should come from. Any thoughts on that? Well, 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 certainly it comes in part from coordination, right? Everyone needs to get on the same page. You can't have academics doing things that practitioners think are stupid or addressing their, their research issues that aren't solving the, the, the practical issues of design. So I, I see it being partnership. And I see some resistance or, or maybe some uh, institutional ego that, that keeps parties apart. The more I bring practice and uh, operations into my classroom, the better the job that I can do as an educator. And I, I think leadership comes from all of these parties pulling together to move from one state to another one that we want to, to be in. And yes. Was, uh, yeah. Along that path, and, and I want to hear your thoughts on this, Adam and I are going to start a, well, we've already started a, a mentoring program for young female engineers that uh, either are in university or going to be graduate out of university. And the reason why we've decided to do that is that we had a uh, yay member on, a uh, female engineer, who contacted us and explained to her some of the difficulties she was having at ASHRAE meetings and also on the job site with her male colleagues. So we brought in a psychologist, April Byers, to join us as our co-host on the interview. It was a, it was a fabulous discussion. Cecilia, having overcome many, many difficulties as a female engineer, was really upbeat and really positive about her her career. So it wasn't a moan and bitch session at all. It was it was about what it was like for her to go through school, get onto the job sites, face some of the things that happened to her. And leadership within ASHRAE, I think, has done some good things in terms of integrating female engineers in, but probably not enough. What can we do as a you know the voices of leadership to make that changed? Yeah, well, uh, certainly I think the, the messages are there that, that women are, are welcome and that they're encouraged. But, you know, it's a little bit like Cecilia was saying, you know, when you know, the, they kept picking the, the guy who didn't know what he was talking about to go out into the field, <laughs> right. sending, sending her. And, and so I, I think within our organization, the, the, the most important thing we can do is that when we have a chance to make appointments or nominations, 
to invite them in. And when you start doing that, I, I think you know the balance tips rather quickly because the, when the more women you get involved, uh, they start to have a leadership culture of their own that I think makes it even easier for the next one. So it, to me, that's the main way we could influence it. And, and that comes down to individuals exercising their choices well, when they they look for for people to move up into positions of responsibility, and and that takes a little bit of conscious thought, I think, for for men. Yeah. Uh, you see that in conferences, and it, it's kind of an interesting thing. I go to a lot of conferences because I'm an academic. There's really started to be a movement of protest against conferences where all of the keynote speakers are are men. If, if yes. you have a conference and you don't have any women getting platform time then you're going to hear about it, and, and, and rightly so, because yeah. there are, are many excellent scientists and engineers who ought to be speaking, but someone's got to give them the, the opportunity. So I'm co-chair of the next IAQ conference, and, and we're definitely pursuing that approach. And we, in putting our steering committee together, made sure that we had some very active women yeah. who would help us do that. When I look at you know the the funding that the Sloan Foundation has been doing, particularly in the microbiome. This the mo- well, many if not the I don't know if it, if they're the majority, but the voices that are coming out of those projects are females. They're great scientists. They've got an excellent mind, and I think yes. you know in terms of academia. I mean, if if you're a female, and I and we got we got into it a little bit in the discussion. Their choices, how many of them are choosing to go into the engineering building services part of the industry versus, say, the health sciences. And, you know, we have to find a way to challenge those minds within our scope, you know, within the building, because they're, they can take their minds and they can have a lot of fun with it within buildings and make, make a yeah. career out of it, as many of them do, right? I'm very impressed with the female students we have. We're, we're certainly not at 50 percent, but we're we're higher than, than the rest of the college. But what I've noticed is, is you know, advisor of an ASHRAE student branch is that I, I think most of my leaders over the past five to 10 years have been been women. I think I've had, had more female presidents than than men over that period. And, and there is something that you may have heard of, New Faces in Engineering, that is part of Engineers Week. I think we've had four or five new faces selected by ASHRAE since that program began. Every one of them has been one of our female graduates. That's awesome. I love That's that. awesome. So, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I think all we can do, I think, is keep pushing these good people with as much confidence as we can give them out into the industry. I, I can't go to you know a, an engineer who's my age, who's prejudiced, uh, whether he knows it or not, and and changes his mind. But eventually, I think the generation will will change, and and we'll we'll see what we. Hope to see what we yeah. wish we see now. Yeah. You know, it's funny. A, co- a colleague of mine, sorry, Adam. No, um, a colleague of mine was, uh, you know, looking at uh, job opportunities, and I, one came up for a project manager, and she was more than qualified to have that position. And I said to her, I said, "There's a, you know, a job call out at this particular firm for a project manager." She said, "Yeah, I'll not get the job. If there's <laughs> a man that has this equal qualifications as me, the man will get it." You know what? That hurt. Yeah, that's yeah. That yeah. that I. You know, I've had lots of discussions over the years that that happens. But when she said to me, I won't get the job because the man will get the job, even though we're both qualified, that actually had a deep impact on my, um, not necessarily respect for the profession, but just just how I felt as a male and how we're blocking another person who's equally qualified to get that position because of gender. That's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. We we want to have a meritocracy. That's, I think. And it is disappointing. It, it's our culture. It's not. It's not just engineers. It's it's society. Yes, yeah. right. It's a cultural phenomenon because there's an opportunity cost there, right, to society. Yeah. So she might be the best person for the job. She might be absolutely awesome, but there's a lost opportunity there because she might not get it. And it's mm-hmm. uh, as you say, it's a cultural issue, right? Because we hire. We try to hire in our own image. That's why you should never interview mm-hmm. on your own, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Because you're looking for that person who looks Interestingly, like we just got our first female uh, department head yeah. who will come on board on, on July 1. And not only that, she's a real go-getter who I think got her PhD seven years ago and right. went to Clemson. And in that period of time, became a, a distinguished professor and an associate vice president for research. So 
You know, there are, are people out there who will uh, will really do great things if we give them the chance. Absolutely. I, I, yeah. do, I do want to uh, touch on a subject that's dear to my heart. On So I'm, I'm looking to you now as a prognosticator. Someone who can predict the future, which is always a tricky business, right? <laughs> so I'm a big fan. Look at my coin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so put, put your sorcerer's outfit on <laughs> and look into your crystal ball. I'm a big fan of, I'm a bit of a technology nerd. I'm a big fan of the Internet of Things, but I'm also a bit skeptical. So my personal view is the Internet, of, the falling cost to measure and record building and systems performance, I think is going to have a very profound impact on building design and operation. And I'm trying to coin the phrase unsuccessfully, you know, what I call it. Adam, you have to, you have to remember the yeah. phrase if you're going to coin I it. I know, so I'm having a <laughs> senior <laughs> moment here. <laughs> but what I'm saying is evident, that's it, evidence-based design and evidence-based building operation where, yeah. you know, you can sit there and give the PowerPoint and, yeah, it's going to do this and my energy model says that, but, you know, the reality says this, and I think there's gonna, it's going to have a couple of impacts. One, it's going to bring clarity, and two, it's going to bring consequences because an owner's buying X, I don't know, let's call it Lee Platinum Build, and it's going to do, you know, it's going to have such a energy performance. And then there's going to be a period within a year or two or three or four or five of reality based on objective reality, based on measured things, and then there's going to be an awkward conversation maybe. <laughs> <laughs> or, or an insurance claim, or what? I don't know. But do you see? How, how are you, as, as an educator, how do you see that future, and how do you see your students embracing that possibility? Well, I, I believe that the availability of data ought to be something that that really helps us to improve the performance of buildings. And I, I think the more we're able to mine data from buildings and analyze it, probably the less we're going to rely on the kind of simulation that we do now because we know all of these prospective models are wrong to some extent and it doesn't really surprise me when actual performance doesn't match up very well. I think in the future what will would be the the likely trend is that we'll we'll have buildings that try to to fix themselves and we have model free controls where the building is analyzing its control systems are analyzing the data that we're extracting from it and making adjustments that maybe a human designer or operator wouldn't see, or at least providing insights that will allow them to make changes. I agree with a lot of people that complexity is not necessarily a a good thing. And then a lot of the uh, trend of control concepts has been towards more and more complexity and optimization. I think we should always be trying to make them as simple as possible and and maybe acknowledge that there's going to be an ongoing role for a human in the loop to some extent and, and focus on advisory controls. But I think there's great potential there. The concern I have is that Many buildings have a huge amount of instrumentation that is producing a lot of data now that isn't getting analyzed or it's it's from instruments that aren't being maintained. You can't just install them. You have to calibrate them, make sure everything's working. And we, we already have that resource in place in, in, in a lot of facilities and aren't really doing much with it. Yeah, so it's, it's a, a challenge. That's a key insight, actually. I didn't think of that. There's an indifference already to the amount of data being harvested, right? So why would we yeah. be interested in that data going forward? What would drive the interest in that data? That's an interesting question. I never thought of that perspective, actually. Well, I think Paul Gezzi, one of our other guests that we had on, yeah. Adam, has an answer to that. And that is, is that for him, if buildings can become power plants, generating that power and then exporting that into the grid... That data then becomes very important in terms of it, the operation of the systems. Yeah. So and then, yeah. and then, who's the, who the guy we had on the um, the IoT guy, uh, Paul Lucy? Or? Oh, Paul Gezzi. Yeah. That's no, no, no not Paul Gezzi. Uh, um, yeah. Mario Lucy. Mario Lucy. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry, Mario. I forgot your name there for a second. But that was an interesting discussion too because he talked a lot about Internet of Things and. I can't remember if we talked about artificial intelligence with them, but intelligent buildings doesn't just mean, you know, what's being obtained from thermostats. But when you think about what nanotechnology can do within a building, you know, low cost, small sensors spread throughout the building, right? So, yeah. 
Well, well you know, and looping, looping back to the, the district energy idea, though, I, I think that there's great potential in taking data from buildings and using it to optimize things on that, that community yeah. level, which is yeah. basically how they're doing the great stuff they're doing in Scandinavian countries. Actually, what Paul Gezi was getting to, I yeah. think, was what you've got to do is monetize that data, right? So at the moment, mm. that data is not monetized. It's sitting there, and it has zero value. If you could somehow give that value, then it will become very important, right? That's, that's, mm. the, that's the trick to move it to the next level, I think. Yeah. So that could be monetized in the form of energy savings, which is where Mario Lucy was going, right? I take that yeah. data, I use yeah. it to make good decisions, and I reduce your energy costs. Yeah. But there's also, it could also have value as design data, right? So I can tell you with super accuracy, you know, student accommodation, they turn the lights on at this time, they turn them off at this time, the water demand is at this time and this time, and then you can make more educated design decisions based on that data, right, and low yeah. profiling. That's where the data yeah, it's, has value. It's surprising how, how low the occupancy is in, in a lot of buildings most of the time, and yet we keep conditioning them like people are there. In fact, there's, there's a faculty member at Carleton yeah. who, who was doing a, a control study. I can't remember the name, but maybe you've, you've run into this gentleman. And one of the things they monitored was his office, and it turned out in the year that they monitored his office, he was in it 10% of the time, I think. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, so if we could get buildings just to react effectively to occupancy, we would immediately see huge energy savings yeah, dy yeah. dynamic uh, demand control i would call that right mm -hmm. that's, that's what you need and again i think there's this real coming together of the falling cost of the ability to measure that you know i see a time i see a future where you know you can get like 10 cent 25 cent sensors they could be on every outlet right telling you mm -hmm. like, uh, temperature relative humidity even controlling a damper and then an occupancy sensor tied in with that with an rfid Frequency could say, right, there is no one in this room. Just shut down. Boom. Lights off. Everything off. I did a yeah. job in, in 2000 at JFK Terminal 4, and the designer there it was a British import, I think. He, I got on there, and there were the internal VAV boxes had a, a VMAX design to meet cooling load, and mm -hmm. the minimum was zero. Right? And he sa I said, I yeah. said, what? what? What's going on here? <laughs> he said, if no one's in that room, I don't care if the lights go off and that goes to zero. As soon as someone comes in, they'll, it'll generate a demand. That box will yeah. fire up. It will bring in the outside air. And I thought, I couldn't knock that logic, actually. I tried. I couldn't knock it down, though. You know, so... Oh, it makes, makes sense. It makes VAV systems that much less bad. Yeah, exactly. He found a way <laughs> to make them suckless. <laughs> so shout out to Ian, Ian Stewart at Arup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, again, it challenged my thinking because I come in there with yeah. all the orthodoxy and my backlog of this is how it should be. And he just went, no, 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 we're not doing that. And he was right. Yeah. <laughs> so there needs to be more people like him, actually, I think. That's, that's what needs to happen. Yeah. That's a skill, being able to be critical of your own lenses. Yeah. Because I immediately um. wanted to go, no, no, no. I awesome i found this big problem everything's zero that's not right and uh, <laughs> he just put me in my place like a boss and it was awesome actually when I look back on it. <laughs> yeah yeah so. i you know if i think go back in my career i can think of a half a dozen times where someone who was a lot smarter than i was had a lot more experience put me in my place and at the moment they were very awkward <laughs> encounters yeah. but I'll always be grateful for those half a dozen experiences. Yeah. Bill, can yeah. you think of can you think of one or two experiences that you had in your career that were awkward because some guy was looking down upon you going, Bill, no, that's not reality. <laughs> I'm really trying to think. I certainly I've had experiences where someone said that's not going to work because it was too academic. But it's an actual an actual story. Off the top of my head, I'm I'm having a hard time coming up with one. Maybe I've suffered memory loss because of the traumatic experience. <laughs> It's never well, that's, comfortable, that's, right? Yeah. That's what I remember. I have certainly had clients who thought of things that I, I hadn't thought of that were, were just terrific ideas. Yeah. That's, I guess, the, the positive side of it. <laughs> so we're, we're coming up on the hour. I, uh, Robert introduced a, a theme at the end of a, a recent interview where we asked someone like yourself, what's, what, what's the advice you would give certain people in our industry, right? So... What would be your advice today to an architect, to an engineer, and to a student 
So what would be like a, a key piece of advice you would give them for the future the or for today? The individual yeah. pieces of advice. Yeah. Uh, dude, well, to an architect, don't assume that the engineers can do anything. <laughs> I, I think that, 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 you know, that one of the problems with architecture has, has been, you know, unbounded confidence in the ability of engineers to make any building work. Yeah. So, you know, the, the architect will start by designing the, the building so that the engineers can, can deal with it. And that's probably my ad, advice to them. To the engineers, what, what would you never stop imagining that there might be a better way mm. to, to do it? Because I, I think in practice, the tendency is to get into a, a rut of doing things the ways that you've, you've done them that are, they, they look efficient, but you're, you're maybe missing some great opportunity. So you, you become the world's best VAV system designer when you could have been the world's best DOAS system yeah. designer. You just learned about the other technology. Yeah, that's um, nice. And to the students, you know, question everything. You know, always ask questions, always try to understand why and, and ask whether, whether that's the best way. And I think we don't want to send them out into the world with, already with crystallized ideas of, of how things should be, but rather with a set of tools that allow them to, uh, to answer their own questions. Actually, that is a great thought. Yeah, they, they're not being indoctrinated. They're being given skills to go and make change, right? Yes. Yeah, I like that. That is a good yeah. thought to close on, actually. Question yeah. everything. Remember that, everybody. Question everything. I'm a big fan of that. <laughs> Don't, don't trust anyone over 30. Oh, wait. That's, yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's us out. <laughs> 70 is the new 30. That's yeah. 30. <laughs> Ooh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, Bill, that was awesome. Thank you for coming on. We're coming up on the hour now. So our, yeah. our basic assumption is people lose a little live after an hour on a podcast. So we try and keep them to an hour. But I could talk to you for a, a long time on these subjects. So thank you for coming on. It's been awesome. Yeah, yeah. My pleasure. Well, we didn't even get to my, you know, to indoor environmental quality. So, yeah, maybe another time. Actually, yeah. Yeah. I'd love to yeah. do a podcast on that because that's a very yeah. underrated, flies under the radar too much, that subject, I think. Well, particularly because you've done a lot of work with UV light and yes. the biohazards and the chemical hazards. Yeah, I really, we forgot all about that. Well, you wouldn't forget about it. We just got, we just got talking. <laughs> so, uh, great conversation. That, I enjoyed it, guys. Oh, well, yeah. I'll tell you what, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Will you commit to come on in the next six, sometime in the next six months? And we'll just do a whole episode on IAQ because I think yep. that is a very underrated subject that people just, uh, it's just uh, forget about it, you know? And yeah, I would I'd be happy to do that. And you can tie that into wellness. There's so many aspects that ties mm -hmm. into, right? Building performance, wellness. So, yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, great. Okay. Well, awesome, Bill. Thank you, man. Great. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much. So Take care. Yeah, bye, bye bye. So, what do you think, Adam? That was an, an awesome interview again. Yeah, he was awesome. And you know what? That five year degree sounds great because that is an applied engineering degree and it takes in the whole holistic overview of buildings. What a great program. Yeah, and what a great guy to be running it uh, or part of it because with his back, his practical background and his academics, you know, if I was a student in that program, I, I think you may not value that going through school because your head's all in the in the yeah. in the weeds. But when you get out of school, you'll appreciate that uh, combination. Yeah, you could tell he's got real experience. I like that, and, and students can tell, man. it when I was a uni, and you knew. When I, one of my when I did my technology degree, they used to bring in guest lecturers from industry, and they were just awesome. They were them lectures were always fully attended, they were always entertaining. You know, there was a clear distinction between the pure academics and the people who had industry experience. Right, you need both. You need both for sure. But yeah. you know, you, someone who can just say that I did this and it worked and it didn't work. There's some social proof to that that is very valuable and underrated. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I love, I mean, five-year, I had no idea that program was there. I mean, five-year program, that's a that's an expensive haul, right? That's one of the problems with five-year programs. They're expensive. But, yeah, you know, to cover architectural engineering and engineering, you know, in the building, five years is probably the right time, right, with some co-ops. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I mean, here, in, I, I 
I don't know what it is in the U.S., but certainly here in Canada, you're going to do eight years whether you like it or not. Whether you, If you go the university route, it's four years and then four years of articling. Yeah. If you go the technology route, it's either two or three years, and that's you're going to do either six or five years of articling. Yeah. At the end of the day, before you get your ticket, you're going to do eight years. Get used to it. <laughs> you know, this is... <laughs> this is the thing they don't tell students, right? I think it's a bit of a sale, deliberate sales thing. They draw you in and then at the end of it, oh, by the way, you know you've got an engineering degree. Well, guess what? You're not an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, you're just getting started. Yeah. You've just got a ticket to play the game there. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you would That's think right. that people who someone who wanted to be an engineer would do the research and find out what it takes to get qualified, but you'd be amazed at how many people don't do that. Yeah. It staggers me how many people go in and get halfway through engineering school and realize, you know, they're not getting that coveted certificate and ceremony until way down the road. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. Hey, he did. He did some. He talks about some really things that interesting things that I hadn't even thought about before. I, you know, this whole thing about storing energy, like yeah. it's it was on my radar screen, but sort of at the peripheral edges, you know, in terms of how do we, and I, you know, and I knew about thermal storage, but he, he really brought some practical when he talked about what they're doing in Denmark, and that is, you know, so you are generating electrical energy, and battery storage is a challenge, but. Thermal storage isn't. We have, been, like you said, we've been doing it for centuries. So running electric boilers, peak times when you know when it's available, and putting that energy into a storage tank or in the ground. We didn't actually get into that. I imagine it was storage tanks, but possibly yeah. also the ground itself. It just makes a whole bunch of sense. Yeah, and also think about it. It's low tech, right? How? Yeah. How much technology do you need to dig a great big hole with a crane and stick a bloody tank down there? Right? Yeah. It's not that goddamn expensive. <laughs> No, right. no, it isn't. Yeah, I mean, we have a project here south of Calgary that uh, where they're doing that to some degree, but this, yeah. but this, but the the uh, power generation is not photovoltaics; it's uh, thermal storage. So they got thermal collectors on the roof, and uh, during uh, you know peak summer times, they're just dumping that excess heat into the ground, and then they extract it during the during the uh, the winter months. But the the electric stuff, the photovoltaic, that's where the challenge. The thermal stuff, we that's that's just vanilla. Like we got that all figured out. But the photovoltaic stuff. Is interesting. That was a real good example of what we can do with these peak loads where there's excess generation. So there's a high, if you've got a mass, let's just say you've dug the hole and stuck a massive thermal store, water tank down there, right? And then how do you generate the energy you store in there? It could be a cascade of things, right? It could be solar thermal. It could be electric when? using boilers at peak time where you've got excess capacity. Yeah, it's it's the gift that keeps on giving, right? Yeah. Once well, and. And the thing with the Danes is that they'll take their municipal wastes and they'll burn it. Yeah. And, you know, and then, of course, they have very high emission requirements. So they, you know, the filtration systems keep particulate matter down and gases and that type of stuff. So they, they recapture a lot of that. But, you know, the waste is going to be used and they're going to use it for either current loads, thermal loads, or they're going to store it. Yeah. So there's one, you know, the full photovoltaics is another one. There's, the, And, of course, they have a lot of wind power, a lot of windmills there, right? So they're a, a culture that gets it. They, they're, we should, the rest of the world should be looking at Denmark, and not just Denmark because there's other Nordic countries too, right, that are doing yeah. equally good stuff. But that is the model for mankind. I mean, we've got to come up with a different word, mankind, it's, for humanity. Now, even that's not even what a push gender back. correct. The pushback in North America is always, oh, we've got big scale here, right? You know, there's millions of us, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you know what? Bring it to a city base, right? Yeah. The cities have 500,000 to a million to 2 million people. You know, this these projects, for some reason, we've managed in North America to have infrastructure for electricity. Why can't you have infrastructure for heating and cooling? Yeah. Right? It's... Uh, is it culture? I don't know. It's short-termism ultimately, right? Because what you got to sell is a long-term vision with long-term investment for long-term gains that are really going to compound to future generations. Yeah. So, you know, if you're a current generation taxpayer, what do you care, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's the you know, If you do the, the Sam Walton trick and you get on a plane and you start flying over communities and watch where they might be growing, and you, and you know this, I mean, they, mm. the cities decide, okay, well, the next phase of development is going to be in this particular area, so they acquire the land. You know, some farmer goes to lives his life for the rest of his life somewhere down in the south. And, uh, <laughs> but 
you know, there's going to be a hospital, there's going to be schools, there's going to be shopping centers, and then there's going to be the housing developments. And I look at every one of those cul-de-sacs where there might be, you know, 15, 20 houses around a cul-de-sac. Why do we have to have 15, 20 heating and cooling plants? We could, that one cul-de-sac could have a central plant distribution module that could be fed, you know, from power generated from the hospitals and the, the schools and the shopping centers. You know, the way we... The way we do it now, it's just so barbaric. It's so old. The other argument against big district systems is, oh, single points of failure, yada, yada, yada. But if you have the infrastructure there, you can feed the energy into that from multiple points, right? So you can have resilience. Yeah, absolutely. A hierarchy of resilience at that, right? Yeah. (laughs) And you know, if you th- and if you take it down to the micro level, if you actually ask, say, for example, the owner of a home, they're going to have mechanical systems in there one way or another. Yep. You're not going to you're not going to avoid that. So the question becomes: When there's maintenance in that building in your home, do you want the maintenance to be done outside of your house, or do you want the maintenance guy to come inside your house? Yeah. And you know, some of these district energy systems, the mechanical, it's a the room is a closet on the outside of the house. The, yes. the, the service guy doesn't even have to come into the house, you know. So there's that element to it. And then the other thing is, is that when you have you know 15 or 20 mechanical systems, you have 15 to 20 points of failure. If you have one mechanical system, then you have one mechanical point of failure. I think the, the service maintenance operation, the sustainability arguments are all for district energy. We have to figure out a way to, yeah. You're basically talking about whole life cost in here, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, it's something that developers just not interested in. No. The basic develop, property developer model is I build it, I sell it, I run like hell in the opposite direction. Next job, right? Yeah, under a new name, under a new name. <laughs> yeah, new name, new corporation, new S. New corporation, yeah, absolutely, right? Don't yeah. don't be responsible for anything if you don't have to, right? That's now yeah. the other interesting thing that Bill bit of knowledge that Bill dropped was like the autonomous self tuning buildings. I'm starting to think about that myself. I think that has some legs. You know, a building yeah. once someone will do it. It'll probably be a research job, but someone will set that algorithm up, and it will be if they open sourced it then it would, could be something that could be built on and built on and built on, right? So maybe there's an open source project there, right, for someone to do. Yeah. Because at the moment, unless someone like Google does it and open sources it, it's not going to be open source, right? If Penn State did it, for example, they would just want it to be the Penn State project, right? Yeah. You know, so, again, this is the uh, altruism, right, of uh, doing things. Yeah. yeah, I you know, I get all of that stuff, and you know, and I and I see the benefits, and I've talked about it in the past, yeah. but in practice, I I just get so I've been bitten so many times from technology, you know, because as a designer and a practitioner, you know, we are responsible for that project up until the point where it gets handed over. And when we hand it over, it has to be operating as per our design. And I find that when technology becomes, you know, the holy grail, we never actually can remove ourselves from the project. Ultimately, we're always getting calls about one thing or another, you know. And so the technology, I get it. But in practice, it seems like you get married to it. This is the misalignment of consequences and rewards, I think, because the things are the way they are because people get sued and harassed, right, if they screw up. So everyone plays it super safe. So I think the answer is dumbing systems down as much as possible, but then put in this layer of technology over them to optimise them. But the answer to do, to what you were worried about is you become the provider of that technology solution and you enter into a subscription service. So you are paid to be engaged and optimize that building. That's, right? yeah, that's great. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So <sighs> hashtag that uh, Adam and Robert's copyright 2018 <laughs> <laughs> <The> idea. <laughs> he had um, he had some great advice. I like what we're going to be doing here, asking our guests about the advice that they have. Yeah. He's right. On all three accounts, you know, the architects, don't assume that uh, engineers and engineering can make your uh, art perform as a building. Do you know who suffers the most from that structural engineer? So you get this star architect. He'll do this yeah. conceptual drawing. and he'll say, right, make that safe so it doesn't fall down. I want a, <laughs> I want a 200-foot atrium, a great big cantilever front. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, I'll see you on the opening. I'll be cutting the ribbon, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 
Absolutely. So, you know, so there's, I think that was a that was an excellent, excellent statement. His, uh, his words to engineers, never stop imagining that there's a better way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know what? And you know this, and I know this, and, and practitioners, when you're, when you're looking at the building and you're doing your analysis and you're zoning it all out, and then you're doing load calcs, and then you say, okay, now what? You know, now what? Now what are we going to do for the mechanical systems? And so you come up with concepts and you draft up, you know, concepts and then you you sit back and you go, okay, well, is there a better way? Yeah, that's got to be that's I I know in my practice, always saying that is there a better way? Is there a better way? What happens ultimately when you get old enough and you've asked that enough time is that your solutions become consolidated. You know what works doesn't work. So it's an excellent thing to ask yourself as a as a young practitioner. Is there a better way? Yeah. Um, because it's going to take you a while to, to consolidate it down to where you know what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. And the other thing you said for students, you know, all be questioning because what his point was, and I 100% on board with this, you're not giving them the answers. You're giving them the tools to find the answers, right? When you graduate as an engineering student, you have a basket of tools. It's on you to find the answers, not copy yeah. someone else's answers, right? It's also on you to be creative. You can totally be creative in this profession if you want to. Right? Yeah. Is everyone going to listen to every crazy idea you have? No, but that's the same everywhere, right? Right. I don't know who said it, but they said the answers always exist. It's the questions that need to be developed. Yeah, that's a good, that's a very profound statement, actually. I like that. Yeah. A lot. Right. So learn to ask good questions. Right. Mm. And you learn to ask good questions by exploring, understanding that, like, don't don't put yourself in a box. Like, you know, get rid of the boundaries in terms of your thought process, you know, because there's a challenge. The answer exists. Now you have to figure out what questions to ask. And then the answers will appear. It's like the artist, and I think Jerry Udelson talked about this, is that, you know, when you look at art forms, the sculpture, the sculpture is in the tot- is in the wood, but the totem pole carver just removed what didn't belong yeah. and what was left was the art form. Yeah, that's very uh, profound. But then, yeah. this is my, you know, people say, oh, there's no innovation in our business. There is. Sometimes it's slow, but there's no reason why this business cannot be as creative as any other business, right? Yeah. There's always room for change and innovation and moving things forward and moving the needle. Are there a lot of entrenched industry lobbying going on and mischief? For sure. Doesn't yeah. mean you can't take it on, right? Doesn't yeah. mean you can't still try. Well, and I think that's guys, you know, like Tim McGann and the yeah. Peter Simmons of the world and Bjarni Olsen and but also the guys from Transolar. You know, the guys from Transolar, I mean, they get to work on some pretty cool buildings and they really follow that model of, you know, no boundary thinking, like anything goes, right? We can try as long as there's science behind it and good engineering principles. Yeah, we could pretty much solve a lot of problems. But I think they're also not afraid to tell the architects that that's a really bad idea. But do you know, I think the what really would move the needle is if owners, residential and commercial, ask for these things right too often Mm. they sit there and take what's given rather than drive some innovation and some change right yeah ultimately the people paying the money set the agenda right Right. and in our business i think the people who pay the money just literally put the money out there and take whatever is shoveled their way good bad or indifferent and then because it's such a high capital intensive business the stakes for pushing back too late are just too high, so they go, okay, right? Because, you know, yeah. you, you put a design brief out or you don't. Some people, you just say, oh, give me a lead gold building, right? What does that mean? Nothing. And then yeah. they get it. It's not quite what they want, but then they've got a tenant signed up and, you know, it's like, give me the building, I need the rent roll to run. And that point, yeah. it's over. <laughs> it's over. It's too, wait, yeah. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It's a, and it's a great point because when you think yeah. about some of the really good buildings that have been built in the last uh, five Eight years, all of the all of the um, well, they were they were I would have called they were inoculated in the yeah. beginning. In other words, they knew that there's a potential for for sickness to develop. And I, I, I and I talk about sickness. I'm talking about you know excessive energy bills, poor indoor environmental quality, things breaking down, failure all over the place. That's what I'm talking about. How did they inoculate in that at the beginning? Well, in the beginning, they said, you know what, these things crap happens in buildings. Yeah. Right. So how can we prevent that from happening when it's in design stage 
and not have to do it after the you know the the horses have already left the barn. And so you're right. Like when you get to that day where the buildings are handed over, and if it's not if it's not right, they, there's no choice. They, they, they're screwed. I mean, they've got, the building's the building. You're going to deal with it one way or another, right? The action's in the design phase. The power's in the design phase. And once you go into construction, it becomes a Mexican standoff between the constructor doing what he can to keep his costs low. And he knows as that end date comes, that owner wants that building. Good, bad, or indifferent, he has to take that building, right? Because he's normally got yeah. a tenant on board or he's pre-sold it. So, you know, it's a Mexican standoff. So if the contractor didn't do a good job, say, and then the owner tried to pull him up on it, the best thing the contractor do, it's this, a, this is game theory, right? He just keeps yeah. powering through, gets to the end. The lean act comes in on his side and he says, take this building I'm yeah. out of here. And the owner takes it every time. Yeah. Well, the contractor wants his money. The builder or the owner wants his building because it's all about cash, right? Yeah. And you can't, if you freeze it, you're screwed. Like, I mean, it just, the whole thing collapses, right? So you, so, you know, they, the building gets released. You're right. And then shit happens. Yeah, there's a podcast to do on the lean act. Suits are piled. <laughs> yeah. The lean act was brought in to stop contractors being abused. And that's rightly so, but it's sort of turned the needle too far the other way. It's put so much power in contractors hands that a bad contractor can just like do the Mexican standoff, right? Till that lean, lean act calculation works in his favor then goes that's it i'm done give me the money i'm out of here yeah i've seen contractors in north america walk away from the the hold back because they've just gone as far as they're willing to go and they've made enough money and as i see you yeah <laughs> yeah well and that's what i think you know like companies like ellis dodd and and we've had andrew Bauerback on now yeah. a couple of times you know where they i love their approach you know they're engaged they're engaged with their clients they're engaged with the the design community you know they take that building as just it's one of their pieces of their reputation so you know you've got the ellis dawn image it's got a it's a picture and yeah. each one of the, that picture is built by pieces of the puzzle and each one of those puzzles is a part of their reputation and they really value each piece of that puzzle you yeah, know they, they've made an over choice to be a good actor and embrace the client if you like yeah right? yeah but no many contractors do that they're a bit of an outlier actually i guess because they're in the top tier there's something to be said for doing that right yeah <laughs> So anyway, that's, yeah. a, that's a good note to finish on, actually. You know, yeah. there are rewards for being in the top tier in everything, right? Good work yeah. does ultimately get rewarded, in my opinion. Yeah. So you want to sum up? Yeah, sum up is Bill was awesome, and I cannot wait to get him back on and talk about IAQ because, again, that is such a very – that's a subject that flies under the radar that impacts everyone in every building, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. why, is that, why is that under the radar? I don't understand. We're going to find out. We're going to find out. Okay, man. I'll see you on the next one. Thanks, Adam. All right, take care, man. Good to see you. Bye. You've been listening to the Edifice Complex podcast with Adam Muggleton and Robert Bean. To access show notes for this episode, visit edificecomplexpodcast.com. Also, if you would like Robert or Adam to speak, teach, or consult on your project or business, please email admin at edificecomplexpodcast.com. See you next time.